Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, thank you for joining us this morning, afternoon, or evening from wherever you are. My name is Babita Bisht. I am the Deputy Director of External Affairs at the Green Climate Fund or the GCF. On behalf of our team, I have the honor to open this high-level side event called At a Turning Point, Catalyzing Climate Finance in the Era of COVID-19. This is organized in the sidelines of the United Nations High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, or the HLPF. We have an impressive lineup of speakers today from governments, UN, civil society, international financial institutions, and the private sector. They also represent the partnerships that are at the heart of the Green Climate Fund. The event will be chaired by Mr. Yannick Glemare, our executive, our executive director of the fund. I would like to end with a few housekeeping issues. Firstly, for all of our speakers, please make sure that your mic is on mute when you're not speaking. For audience members, this webinar will have a chat discussion, which we encourage you, you to use throughout the event. We also request audience members to submit questions with our panelists using the Zoom Q&A tab, which we are monitoring. And for those of you using social media, please use the hashtag HLPF and tag GCF in your posts. I will now hand it over to my colleagues to show the film. Thank you once again for joining us. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, dear friends, many thanks for joining us for this discussion on how to catalyze finance to foster a green resilient uh, recovery in developing countries. Why many of the G20 countries have been able to use unorthodox uh, monetary policy instruments to print trillions of dollars to revive our economies the, the, after the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. This option this is unfortunately not uh, possible for most developing countries that are facing inflationary pressure and high level of uh, indebtedness. Not only uh, did the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, put an extraordinary pressure on the, their budgets, but so it has also created a major uh, capital exodus from developing countries. According to IMF, it's about $100 billion of uh, investment capital that will have fled uh, developing countries during the first two months uh, of the crisis. So we are now in a situation where uh, developing countries uh, do not have the capacity to inject liquidity into their economy and could be facing a major solvency crisis and years of uh, austerity. The, as a result of this extremely uh, uh, unfair situation in terms of access to finance, we could see a dramatic inequality 
in the uh, recovery to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Developing countries, which are already the most affected by climate change, could end up also being the most affected by the humanitarian and economic tragedy assured by the COVID-19 pandemic. So how can we, as a global community, foster a green resilient recovery in developing countries based on global solidarity? The, uh, today we have a, with us uh, uh, two panelists of uh, a very uh, prestigious uh, participants that will basically walk us uh, uh, through this, uh, this question. The first panel includes four representatives uh, of government, four very senior uh, political uh, decision makers, and uh, from uh, Ghana, from Rwanda, from uh, UK and Germany. The second panel of uh, esteemed uh, uh, speakers uh, include the CEOs of uh, four key partner organizations uh, uh, from uh, of uh, GCF and uh, CEOs of uh, public, private, and non-governmental uh, institutions. And so, it's now my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, eight uh, panelists. First, I would like to recognize uh, our Excellency, uh, uh, Madame uh, Jeanne Dark. Minister of Environment from Rwanda. Welcome very much. It's a pleasure to have you again with us. I would like to also, it's a pleasure to have you, Minister. I would like also to uh, recognize His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ken uh, Ofari Atta, the Minister of Finance from uh, Ghana. Welcome, Minister. It's a great honor to have you with us. I would like to thank you very much. Hi, Jackie. Nice. Uh, uh, His Excellency Lord Ahmad of Lubundon, the uh, Minister of State for South Asia and the Commonwealth from the United Kingdom. Lord, it's a privilege to have you with us. The, and I would like to recognize Her Excellency Ms. Maya Flasbach, Parliamentarian State Secretary from the General, uh, uh, German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Madame Flasbach, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with you again. Good afternoon. It's nice to see you again. It's a pleasure for me. Thank you. I, I believe it must be our third or fourth panel, and it's always a pleasure. Wonderful. The, uh, <laughs> in different <laughs> capacities in the past. Thank you. I would like also to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Rémi Riou, the chair of the International Development Finance uh, Club and also the CEO of the Agence Française de Développement. I do not see his name, so he might be joining us uh, in a few minutes. The, uh, but uh, I do see my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Carter Roberts, the CEO of uh, the uh, Worldwide, World Wildlife Fund, United States. Carter, it's great to see you. And uh, the, uh, Mr. Kwasi Hamad, it's wonderful to, uh, to see you. Mr. Kwasi Hamad is a CEO from the uh, Pali Karma Sa'awak Foundation, PKSF. My apologies for the pronunciation. You are fully entitled to mispronounce my name. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to have you with us. And I would like to recognize also uh, Jacqueline Novogras from uh, the CEO of Acumen. Here again, uh, it's us, uh, I've had the privilege to be in a panel with you uh, on a couple of occasions, Jacqueline, and it's always great to have you with us. It's really an honor to be here with you, Yannick, and with everyone on this panel. The, uh, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Madame uh, uh, Amina Mohamed, was planning to participate uh, in this panel. Unfortunately, the HLPF is not uh, the quietest moment uh, for uh, the Deputy Secretary General. So uh, the, why we cannot have her in person with us, she prepared a video in order to introduce uh, some of the key theme of this uh, session. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when we launched the Decade of Action to accelerate achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, we did not imagine that the world would soon face a devastating health pandemic and the deepest economic collapse in modern history. That makes achieving our global goals more urgent than ever, and it makes catalyzing climate finance an imperative. COVID-19 has brought the world to a reckoning. We are in a high-risk, high-opportunity environment. 
decisions taken today by governments and businesses could deepen inequalities, entrench our dependence on fossil fuels, and put achievement of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement out of reach. Yet there is also once in a century opportunity to shift the economic paradigm towards more inclusive, carbon neutral and climate resilient development that would allow us to remain within the 1.5 degree limit. In the context of COVID-19, climate investments can deliver a triple win. They can help us adapt to and mitigate the catastrophic impacts of climate change. They can revive and reinvent economies battered by the COVID-19 pandemic. And they can create significant social economic co-benefits, including poverty alleviation, job creation, gender equality, and improve health, food, and water security. But to reap this triple win, nationally determined contributions and long-term strategies will be crucial. That is why I encourage all governments to submit revised and enhanced NDCs well ahead of COP26. The United Nations is supporting developing countries to enhance their climate ambition. We look to the Green Climate Fund to deliver the finance and the support that is needed for ambitious national action. As the world's largest climate fund for developing countries, with a wide network of partners, the GCF can create dynamic coalitions among member states, international and national organizations, the private sector and civil society. At a time when developing countries are facing massive unemployment and unprecedented economic contractions, which translate into tighter fiscal space and a heavier debt burden, GCF finance projects can translate national climate ambitions into concrete actions with strong development co-benefits. The GCF funding can also catalyze larger financial flows for both public and private, which are necessary for a robust economic recovery. Public finance alone will not be enough. The GCF's capacity to offer a wide range of financial instruments is also particularly relevant today. Developing countries, especially least developed countries, and small island developing states will need support to revive their economies without worsening the weight of their sovereign debt. Here I'm calling on the Green Climate Fund and its partners, including UN agencies, to support developing countries' efforts to green COVID-19 recovery measures and accelerate the transition to an inclusive zero, net zero emission and climate resilient development pathway. I also call on all partners to better coordinate their efforts in support of low and middle income countries. These countries will need an ecosystem of support that goes beyond funding to include capacity building and technical assistance. Finally, I urge all partners to ensure that their support reflects the aspirations of local communities. I look forward to learning about the outcomes of the discussion today, particularly about innovative ways to reinforce public-private partnerships to catalyze additional finance to recover better together. Thank you for your engagement and support. It's always a pleasure and an inspiration to listen to uh, the Deputy Secretary General. And I would like to seize this opportunity to uh, deeply thank the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General for their continuous support to the Green Climate Fund and its uh, mission. The, uh, I would like now to kick off uh, our discussion uh, with uh, our first uh, set of uh, panelists, the four uh, uh, senior representatives from the government of Rwanda, uh, Ghana, uh, UK and Germany and uh, the, to, to ask them to share uh, their views on what are the key uh, priorities to foster a green resilient recovery based on global solidarity, what are the key challenges and some of the solutions that uh, we would like to uh, recommend. And uh, with uh, your permission, I would like to start uh, with you, uh, 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 Excellency Jeanne d'Arc, uh, Minister of uh, Environment. And uh, the, uh, it has, uh, GCF enjoy a great cooperation uh, with uh, Rwanda. Some of our most innovative projects are now taking place in Rwanda, and we will all benefit enormously from uh, sharing the experience of uh, Rwanda. Thank you very much, Yannick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to go straight to the question that was addressed to Rwanda 
what are the key priority area and financing challenges for a green COVID-19 recovery in developing countries? And what financing options would be most suitable to boost private investment and align international financial flows towards green resilient recovery efforts? So uh, the key priority areas, ladies and gentlemen, one does revise nationally determined contributions, prioritizes both mitigation and adaptation interventions with the aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 38% compared to business as usual by 2030. Wanda's revised NDCs quantifies the emission targets and the cost for implementation of proposed action. The total estimate cost for Wanda's identified NDC mitigation measures and adaptation up to 2030 is 11 billion US dollars including uh, USD 5.3 billion on adaptation and the USD 5.7 billion on mitigation priorities over the next 10 years. The anticipated source of funding is from public, like our own green fund for NERWA, private, civil society and development partners contributions through different climate resilient and low carbon projects. One does economic priority sectors for a green COVID-19 recovery are embedded in the recent updated climate action NDC with the aim for emission the reduction and the country resilience to climate change. Those priorities are agriculture, fisheries and forest, services and tourism, health, energy, transport and waste management. Financing challenges for a green COVID-19 recovery in Rwanda. In Rwanda, we don't say only green COVID-19 recovery. We add a better green COVID recovery. Stru structural financial challenge. The financial sector in Rwanda is, is still small, despite being increasingly diversified. Most banks primarily finance traditional sectors with short-term financing needs, strict collateral requirements, and very high interest rates. Moreover, because banks rely largely on short-term deposits for lending, they are often not able to provide loans with even two years of term. Secondly, access to finance for green developers. Green project developers have less access to finance as most banks lack specific green uh, financing skills, including technical capacity with new green technologies. And project finance expertise in the green sector and in addition, exorbitant level of collateral up to percentage 150 are often required by commercial banks on green projects. So when developers gain access to finance, it's typically only for a, a short term borrowing. Meanwhile, green assets typically have a relatively longer investment horizon for five years and beyond, which results 
in mismatch of financing green assets with short-term credit. Thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, limited technological capacity in most green sectors. Wanda's private sector has limited technical skills in most green sectors from renewable energies to water and sanitation. The lack of business model development skills on the developer's side, coupled with the lack of financial resources and experience at existing banks has been a constraint with many existing projects particularly new business model or small and medium enterprises. They are unable to scale up or unable to get past pilot or grant phases to access commercial finance. Financing options most suitable to boost private investment and align international finance flows toward green resilient recovery effort. In the, cost, in the context of COVID-19 better recovery, branded financing instruments, including grants, green loan guarantees, and subsidized loans would be effective and efficient drivers for green economic development by bridging financing gaps to jump-starting clean tech markets and unlocking capital for struggling countries, both public and private investments. Overcoming um, market barriers by accelerating market uptake of raw carbon and climate resilient will attract the flow of climate finances. Ladies and gentlemen, financial support from higher income countries could be increased to low income and vulnerable countries and ensure direct flow of financing required to reduce their emissions reduction targets, adapt to the consequences of climate change, and most immediately replenish their disaster funds that may have been depleted by the response to the COVID-19 crisis would also benefit the private investment of developing countries. Lastly, established National Green Bank with stable fiduciary capacity in the low income countries to unlock international climate finances to support both public and private green investment. Together, we can have a better post COVID-19 green recovery. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Many thanks, uh, Minister Jandark. The, uh, your point about the misalignment of finance with sustainable development is very well taken. And many thanks for your insight about how blended finance could enable us to de-risk investment and catalyze uh, private finance. Uh, right now, if my memory is correct, that is by mid-2019, uh, mid, uh, we had $17 trillion uh, yielding negative interest rate in uh, G20 countries. And if we could de-risk this investment and channel it to a financing green resilient recovery, we will be speaking about a totally different world. Many thanks also for your insight on the Green uh, Investment Bank. Indeed, uh, an innovation, uh, institutional innovation that has proven extremely powerful in a number of countries, including in at least two countries of some of our participants. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Jeanne d'Arc. Uh, no, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to, uh, to give the floor to His Excellency Ken Ofari Atta, Minister of uh, Finance uh, of uh, Ghana. 
Ken, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Yannick, and um, thank you to you all um, for being on this panel. It's a really great pleasure and honor to, to, to be here. Um, I think really we've been um, um, uh, very unfortunate with regards to um, financing our SDGs through 2030, and we know we are some trillion billion dollars behind. And of course, the intervention of um, um, this COVID pandemic has thrown everything out of whack, and and things are uh, extremely difficult. And so, in looking at Africa, for example, um, it's a real conundrum as to how we get through um, this COVID situation and then seek to um, look at um, green development, uh, climate change, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so we, we are all struggling and, and, and I think Africa has responded uh, very, very strongly to this as the statistics um, indicate, um, even though that the worst is not over and, and we need to be careful um, about um, the way the way forward. But, but it's really put a lot of pressure um, on us and um, you can see that um, a commodity prices um, have gone down, remittances is problematic, tourism is problematic, and then there's been some hundred billion dollars of capital outflows in addition to that. Uh, and then not to even end there, we are having now to spend more money to import, you know, um, test kits, et cetera, et cetera. So in a situation in which we have, in, we have been impacted by an exogenous um, pandemic, uh, is essentially from outside, uh, we are now being called in a sense uh, to transfer wealth to where the pandemic came from with regards to lower commodity prices for the West, tourism not coming in, remittances not coming in, and then capital flight, and then acquisition of health. Um, so you, you can see uh, the continual imbalance of, of global affairs and what it means um, to us. Um, so really in my mind is, is a call uh, for literally a tectonic shift in the whole global architecture um, because it's really not fit for purpose uh, for the future. You look at um, currently uh, in Africa, maybe about $350 billion worth of debt, debt servicing of about 44 billion a year. Um, uh, and we are of course paying what they call um, Africa risk premium um, for borrowing. Um, so when you see uh, Africa Development Bank um, borrowing money now, luckily because of the non-regionals and therefore the triple A uh, wraparound, they are able to borrow at about 0.75% to be able to give those resources to us. Uh, when we go directly to the international capital markets, uh, it's north of 6 or 8%. In effect, this $44 billion that we are paying annually um, could be about 17 billion. Why are we paying $23 billion um, out for a presumed risk where Africa has really not financially defaulted in the longest time? Um, so um, a very stable environment the past 10, 15 years um, sadly being hit um, by this pandemic, uh, which means that 5% uh, net of our GDPs are uh, impacted and we are needing to somehow find resources up to 15% of our GDP to be able to get into a recovery. Uh, we don't have the toolkit to do that. We don't have reserve currencies. Um, so the OECDs are able to deploy anywhere north of 8 trillion, uh, breaking all classical theories to ensure that livelihoods are kept, the organizational capacity for their um, firms are maintained and the recovery will continue. Um, so you and we are at this juncture arguing about SDRs, uh, which could really um, solve the liquidity problem. 
um, and there are political issues why that is not being done. But at the very least, the 260 billion of unused SDRs could be deployed effectively um, for Africa to be able to get out of, of, this, of this pandemic. And we need to look at that. We really, the African finance ministers have therefore also sought to create an SPV, uh, which could have a AAA wraparound such as the AFDB has, and that will completely change the way in which we fund SDGs, we fund infrastructure in a much more sustainable way. Now, Yannick, you mentioned that there's seven trillion dollars or so. It's really about 43 billion of those earning negative interest rates, those at par, etc., um, which is not being deployed because we cannot get into that because of the way we are rated. A wraparound makes it makes all that resource available to us um, to ensure um, that this continent that will have a quarter of the world's population by 2050 and most of the youth population in the world is being able to uh, be sort of galvanized um, to really come into its own. So the challenge is, is, is one in which um, we need to, to realize that we are at a very critical juncture, exacerbated by the pandemic, and we just need to be honest and clear to ourselves that what do we do to enhance global prosperity and, and the arc of history or development will not move if Africa is not developed. Um, so our challenge really, um, ladies and gentlemen, is for us to really set up a global panel um, to truly discuss um, these issues because we have over hundred trillion dollars under management which is more than enough to be able to support our SDGs to bring Africa out of this morass that we are in exacerbated uh, by the pandemic and, and simply uh, in, in, a, in an architecture that is not fit for purpose and for the world. Um, so I thank you for this panel um, but, but I think we are uh, at a serious point um, uh, in sort of global history um, to, to really look at this seriously. Um, and just to stress, to be in the situation and to realize that even in the situation, we still are transferring wealth to the West uh, becomes a difficulty to, to absorb and makes it difficult uh, for us because we are likely to move uh, from this recession uh, first time in the past 20 years uh, into a depression, uh, which then creates uh, anomalies um, for all of us. Uh, there's work to be done um, and we need leaders uh, to stand up um, to challenge the current status quo and change it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for this extremely rich observation, for reminding us about the deep unfairness of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the very high risk to have a similar unfairness in the recovery, the, uh, particularly for countries uh, relying on commodity price, uh, tourism so, uh, as major source of uh, revenues. The, uh, you are uh, speaking about uh, breaking uh, classical theories with uh, quantitative easing, we have seen the richest countries actually uh, basically making money out of making uh, money and uh, with a dramatic reduction in interest rate. The why at the same time in uh, emerging economies and developing countries, we have seen a dramatic increase in uh, interest rate. And so uh, it's difficult for anybody not to share this uh, sentiment of uh, injustice. The, uh, it's, uh, you have given us some extremely interesting pointer on the use of SDR, a question that uh, normally always create a lot of uh, a very animated debate, but definitely a debate that uh, has uh, uh, to take place. And uh, the, uh, see uh, the discussion uh, today as our modest contribution toward uh, maybe a global panel that will discuss this kind of uh, issues. So once again, Minister of Agata, many thanks. It's uh, now for me a great pleasure to uh, give uh, the floor to His Excellency, Lord Ahmad of, Rim of Rimbledon. Uh, Lord, could we ask you to uh, 
to share the experience of uh, UK in, uh, in the field of green resilient recovery. There's been plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, keywords that have been mentioned, such as, for example, a green investment bank. If my memory is correct, this was a British uh, innovation. And uh, so I'm sure we will very much uh, benefit uh, from uh, all your uh, insight. And uh, I would be remiss if I were not to seize this opportunity to deeply Thanks, UK, as the largest financial contributors to the Green Climate Fund. Well, thank you very much, Yannick, and it, I'm delighted to join you here from London. I wish I could say in July it's a sunny London. It's not. <laughs> um, it's rather overcast. And being the Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, this is normally what we get when Wimbledon's actually running. So uh, some things don't change. I'm also minded, it would be remiss of me not to note that um, there is another Ahmed on our panel today. And as the old adage goes, two Ahmeds are better than one. So with that very brief intro, it's my immense pleasure to join this very esteemed panel on an issue which is very important to us in the United Kingdom because it's important to the world in all our partnerships. And having joined together today with also the minister from Rwanda, uh, delighted to be on a panel with her because we are partners on, in the context of the Commonwealth family and as chair in office of the Commonwealth. This is a key priority for us as we hand over the baton to Rwanda and Kigali next year. But friends and colleagues, the world remains, as we've all seen, in the grip of this pandemic. But it is, if I could quote something sort of positive in every respect, is to really search out the green shoots of recovery. As economies are unlocked, we are rightly focused on both the caring, but also importantly, the curing. But in our response, we cannot forget climate change and the challenges of climate. Our collective recovery needs strong roots in the greener and more resilient global economy. The challenges, as we all know, are enormous. We also know these have been multiplied with the COVID crisis, particularly for the vulnerable communities around the world, as the burden of COVID-19 takes its toll together with the impacts of climate change. So as countries recover from the pandemic, it's also a huge opportunity for all of us. I totally subscribe to the sentiments of others about how we need to work together. I think Amina's video was particularly poignant in laying out the challenge for the global community. It's an opportunity to do build back better, yes, but also greener and lay the foundations for sustainable and inclusive growth. Collective international action is not just necessary, it's crucial, it's pivotal. And the United Kingdom will lead work on recovering better for sustainability at the request of the UN Secure Secretary General. With our partners, as I've already said, with Rwanda, but also Fiji and the EU, we will seek to boost cooperation on a recovery that aligns with the sustainable development goals and the ambitions of Paris. And as we ourselves prepare, we've had to, because of COVID-19, defer Glasgow's uh, COP26 till next year. We want all countries to submit more ambitious nationally determined contributions making the contribution transformation to a modern, clean economies globally. We want all countries committed to net zero, as we have already done so here in the UK. And ahead of COP26, what I wanted to do very briefly is help from all countries to help speed up the progress in, across five key areas, if I may. Those key areas, firstly, is clean energy. We need to move away from our polluted past. We need to embrace low cost, zero emissions technologies, and boosting that investment could increase global jobs in the sector fourfold by 2050. Secondly, in resilience, we need to help communities adapt to the worst effects of climate change through resilient infrastructure and agriculture. Adaptation investments can consistently deliver high returns with benefits between two and 10 times the cost. If I may, anecdotally, you know, on visiting different parts of the world, I've seen myself as countries restore areas such as mangroves, it helps to protect coastlines from the real challenges of mother nature. And turning to nature, in nature itself, we need to safeguard ecosystems and protect natural habitats. And we can scale up nature-based solutions and green our supply chains at the same time. Across transport, we need to bring forward the date when zero emission vehicles will not only be cleaner than petrol and diesel, but also cheaper. And in finance, you know, I, I was listening very carefully to the previous contributions. I spent 20 years in the city of London. Um, so it's an area I know well. 
but we need in this crucial area to unleash the capital that will pay for these actions, as rightly the minister uh, from Ghana said. And turning to finance, specifically, we need developed countries to fulfill their commitment to the $100 billion in annual climate finance from 2020. From a United Kingdom perspective, we have already committed to double our international climate finance to over 11 billion pounds between 2021 and 2025. I was honored and to announce this on behalf of our Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the high level meeting at Anga in September last year. Secondly, we should increase the availability of finance for adaptation and resilience. And at the same time, we need action to improve the effectiveness of these investments. Again, one thing I would say, particularly for, for the developing countries of the world, some of these countries, as we all should acknowledge, don't have the capacity, the administrative capacity, to search out the sources of finance. We need to ensure those sources and ability uh, to access finance is made that much more easier. And linked to that, we need more finance, it needs to flow into low carbon investments. We also need to build new private-public partnerships, a pipeline of projects and market structures to increase sustainable private finance to develop countries. And we also need better reporting of climate risk with the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures becoming the standard. Using public finance effectively is key, it's pivotal. Finding new ways to mobilize and channel capital to countries, sectors and projects that need it. Our shared efforts through the Green uh, Climate Fund, and thank you very much for your kind words, Yannick, at the start, uh, are important. And alongside other partners today, we can play a key role. The fund is already playing a much needed uh, role in projects all in over 100 countries. Last year, the fund raised nearly $10 billion in its first replenishment. So it's well resourced to do much more. And the United Kingdom's pledge of over 1.4 billion pounds sterling, making mm -hmm. us the largest contributor to the fund, mm -hmm. shows the value and importance we place on multilateralism and working together with countries as partners through our shared global institutions. This is perhaps even more important as we face the twin global challenges of both COVID-19, the pandemic sweeping the world and climate change. In closing my remarks, it's often said we're, these are extraordinary times. It, these are unprecedented times for all, in, certainly in our lifetimes, since the time of the Second World War. I often quote that the one learning above all else for me personally during this crisis has been the interdependency of humanity. We now need our resources to go even further than before. By working together, as other ministers have said, we need to mobilize more investment from the multilateral development banks and from the private sector in support of our shared goals. We need this to achieve a green recovery and deliver on the commitments that we, we have made, including those in Paris. And let me assure you, on our behalf, from the United Kingdom's behalf, we are ready to be bold and ambitious in partnership with all of you. And we are ambitious ahead of what we hope will be a pivotal COP26 in Glasgow. And we look forward to welcoming you all to Scotland next year. Yannick, thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me join uh, my hope to your hope about a very successful COP26. This generation and all the other generation uh, needs it. We are all in the end of uh, the political leadership of uh, your governments to ensure that we have a COP26 that meets the expectation of the world uh, population. It's, thank you very much for uh, the uh, reminding us about the importance of uh, the nationally determined contribution. The four governments that are uh, currently crafting the green resilient recovery, uh, a wonderful source of uh, ID in terms of stimulus measures is actually in this uh, NDCs. Some of, uh, some of the most powerful uh, initiatives in order to revive uh, economies and to accelerate the transition toward a low emission climate resilient uh, development are actually in this uh, NDCs. Everything that has to do with, for example, energy efficient construction or uh, renewable energy or climate resilient agriculture or restoration of ecosystem, both can provide immediately some uh, economic stimulus. For once, the facts, uh, to come back to your point, uh, Minister Jandak, the fact that for once, the, we have a lot of uh, upfront 
capital expenditure is good because it creates uh, employment. And so uh, for, uh, for, uh, for all governments around the world trying to uh, basically leverage the NDCs to foster a green resilient recovery and leverage a grid resilient recovery to enhance the ambition of uh, the uh, NDCs could be, uh, could be a major uh, path for, uh, for up. So very many, many thanks, uh, Lord Ahmad. The uh, uh, State Secretary, uh, Maya Flashback, it's a pleasure to give you again uh, the floor. The, uh, I did thank uh, the government of uh, UK for uh, its contribution to the Green Climate Fund. So I have to thank the government of uh, Germany for its contribution to the Green Climate Fund. And because actually the, uh, the government of Germany was the first to announce uh, its contribution to the Green Climate Fund just before uh, uh, the COP in Katowice in uh, November 2018. And the government of Germany announced that it will double its pledges to, uh, to the Green Climate Fund. And suddenly it completely changed the conversation. It was not, uh, should we or not contribute? It was, should we or not meet the uh, level of uh, ambition of Germany? Uh, regarding UK, the answer was yes. The, uh, so, uh, the, uh, 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 Maria, could I give you the floor for you to share the experience of Germany on how to uh, foster and capitalize a green resilient recovery? Yannick, thank you very much for this, uh, for this very, very kind uh, introduction. And Ahmad, uh, thank you very much for this very, very kind invitation to Glasgow next year. And I, I really hope that we then will meet personally and not only virtually, but uh, now we take it as it is. So um, nice to meet you all at your um, uh, screens, excellencies and uh, distinguished guests. Um, so we meet today uh, because we are all, all convinced that a paradigm shift uh, toward a low emission and climate resilient development is needed now more than ever. Um, that is also the reason why we doubled, uh, Janik, you just mentioned it, we doubled our contribution providing 1.5 billion euros for the Green, green Climate Fund uh, first uh, replenishment. Um, at COP21 in Paris, we agreed to, we all, the temperature goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, enhancing adaptation and climate resilience and third, making all finance flows consistent with these goals, and this is our ambitious goal. These commitments need to remain our goal and uh, be the benchmark for designing recovery packages to deal with the consequences of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. The financial um, decision made over the next 12 months will shape the global economy for the next uh, decade. We have a unique window of opportunity to build back better and greener, paving the way for a more sustainable future. The public instruments we need for this are at hand to name, but a few is uh, first scaling up green bonds, second strengthening climate and disaster risk insurance, third implementing effective carbon pricing, Fourth, de-risking renewable energy investments through blended finance. And fifth, phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. However, we cannot stop there. We must also make substantial progress on aligning all financial flows with the Paris goals. This will require greening financial tax and procurement systems and creating enabling environments for Paris aligned private sector investments. The Green Climate Fund is uniquely, as we, we think, as we believe, as we, are, uh, we, 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 we true believe, is uniquely positioned um, to support developing countries in this endeavor, for example, via its um, readiness program. That said, the most important contribution by the Green Climate Fund in the context of the green recovery is continued support for new, even more transformative projects and mitigating negative impacts 
of the crisis on its existing portfolio. For strategic direction on how the Green Climate Fund can achieve this over the next couple of years, we need to urgently adopt a new strategic plan. This plan should include ambitious guidance on boosting private investments and aligning financial flows as discussed here today. At the Green Climate Fund and elsewhere, we must go beyond business as usual and promote transformation. This is the only way to bring about the needed paradigm shift. And thank you, Yannick, for your work and thank you all together, all other, other persons on this panel. Thank you very much for your engagement. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Maya. We have some uh, very strong uh, common theme that have emerged uh, from uh, this discussion, and notably uh, the importance of blended finance to de-risk investment, to make sure that uh, we realign uh, money from a negative interest rate toward, uh, toward investment that are not only financially attractive, but have also huge development uh, co-benefits. And uh, given that we have such a strong consensus, so let's hope that we will be able to translate this into uh, action. The uh, by COP26. We have received a number of uh, questions. And, uh, the, and there are at least a couple of questions. That, so with your permission, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, to the panelists. And we have, uh, maybe I will ask each panelist to be very brief because we have only a few minutes. But you will see, it will be a pity not to ask these questions. So I will start with the first one and uh, uh, leave it to any of the four panelists to take them. The, uh, the, the how practical is it to insist on green uh, COVID recovery measures when capital availability of developing nations and LDCs is scarce? How practical is it to insist on a green recovery when the LDCs and developing countries are struggling to get access to, uh, to capital. Maya? I'm, 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 thank you. I'm strongly convinced that if we do not insist in a, in a greener and better recovery, we have no, no chance to, to, um, to, to, go into the, to go into a sustainable future. We have no chance because I think the, the climate change is, is as minimum as dangerous um, as the COVID-19 pandemic fun. is. And so we now have just to, to force and just to strengthen uh, our way to a greener future. Many thanks, Maria. Anybody else from our esteemed panelists would like to uh, also respond to this question? Yeah, if I can just come in, I agree with um, a German colleague as well. And I think the other thing is about ensuring, it's all very good talking about it, is ensuring that the sources of finance are readily available. And that's why there is a need for the developed part of the world. And we've all, we're all going through difficulties. You know, our domestic challenges are immense, but this is the real test of our metal to see notwithstanding the domestic challenge that we have, whether we can ensure that we continue to work with other communities. Because, you know, if even we look at ourselves, the fact is, it's a global community when we're talking trade, we're talking about security, we're talking about climate change. It's a global challenge and it requires that interdependency of working together. So I think stressing more about those that have made commitments to stepping up and making sure they're fulfilling commitments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister Jeanne d'Arc. Thank you very much, Yannick. I, I, I agree with my two colleagues, Maria and Diro Dahmat, that uh, if we don't do anything now, even if we are poor, if we don't do anything about mitigation and adaptation, we are going deep, deep into poverty. Because there are things we can do uh, for green recovery that do not require finance. If we are talking about plastic bottle, collecting and recycling plastic bottle, if we are talking about burning plastic bags, if we are talking about cleaning our street, cleaning our, our rivers, 
it, it, those are simple measures that do not need finance to do them. So uh, being poor does not give us, uh, I mean, uh, room for, for doing nothing. We have to act and we have to act yesterday. Thank you very much, Yanni. Thank you very much, Minister. The, uh, if I can impose again on, the, on our panelists for uh, a couple of minutes, I would like to ask a second question. I've had a number of uh, questions uh, about the, the GCF, and there maybe I will try to address some of them at the very end. The, uh, but there is a second more generic question, which uh, you might wish to, uh, to, to address. The, um, do we expect shifting priorities from government in a post-COVID world from climate finance to public health? Maria, I see you nodding negatively. <laughs> yes, I think, I think that are both very, very challenging problems. There's no question, but, but I think it's not a good way just to take the one and leave the other. But we, we, we have to think them um, uh, together to win the future. We have, we have no chance to put the one at the side or the, the other. Uh, we have to take both. The, uh... And if I can say one of the projects that we are currently submitting to our board is a project to electrify more than 1,000 villages that uh, do not have access to electricity. And this will notably electrify health dispensary and enable to treat people 24 hours uh, a day rather than nine. So here, by promoting climate action, you are actually strengthening public health. The, uh, Yannick, if I could just come in very briefly. Yes, no. I think <clears throat> there are of course, there's going to be a balance we're making with the COVID crisis. A lot of countries, particularly in the developing world, are having to make budget decisions. What can we do? I think there was a very notable action at the G20 on the whole issue of interest on debts. So I know that was raised by our colleague from Ghana. That's the kind of thing you can do without compromising it and making it kind of one or other decision. So I think more needs to happen at that level to release domestic financing so countries in the develop developing world can deal with the COVID crisis domestically without worrying about big interest payments. Many, many thanks. The, we are a little bit behind time, but so I have one question for the, uh, being asked for the ministers uh, from uh, Ghana and uh, Rwanda. So uh, the, uh, it's for you, uh, Minister Jean d'Arc and, uh, 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 and Ken. The, uh, what, in, a, in a sense, what would you like the GCF uh, uh, to do in order to uh, uh, assist, assist you in accessing finance to support your uh, uh, green recovery efforts from COVID-19. So what would you expect from us, the Green Climate Fund, to help a developing country access the finance they need to foster a green resilient recovery? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Yannick. We would like to see uh, GCF to finance our green project, uh, be it public, be it private uh, project. So if they are, uh, GCF will finance our green project, it will be a huge contribution to better green recovery. Thank you. And uh, Minister of Arieta? Oh, hi, I, 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 I got cut off and I'm just back. Um, I, I think I don't really disconnect um, um, uh, our green funding project. The, uh, I can very quickly, uh, just some pointers about some of the things we are doing right now. The first things that we are trying to do to address, to help develop, to support developing country efforts to respond to the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic crisis is first we are trying to make sure that our ongoing portfolio uh, suffer as few implementation delays as possible. Because most of our projects not only can enable uh, countries to maintain uh, their level of uh, climate ambition, but also deliver uh, 
significant development co-benefits in terms of uh, employment, food security, and health. So that's the first thing that we are doing. The second thing is that we can use our uh, grant resources to help developing countries craft their uh, green resilient uh, uh, recovery measures and explore new financing structure to make sure that this does not translate into uh, additional uh, uh, financial duress for uh, indebted countries. And the third thing that we are doing with our 150 partners, and we, we are about to give the floor to uh, four critical, uh, uh, critical partners, the, is actually to accelerate the development of projects that not only can enable to maintain climate ambition in the era of COVID-19, but also can generate major uh, uh, development co-benefits to revive uh, economies. And so we, and this, and we, and most of our projects in terms of catalyzing finance will help in developing an enabling environment and uh, de-risk uh, through often blended finance, first of the kind uh, investment. The, uh, I would like to, uh, to, to ask uh, for a virtual round of applause for our first panelist. And uh, give the floor to our uh, second set of panelists. So now the uh, CEOs of, uh, of international uh, organizations or uh, private sector concern or non-governmental uh, organizations who are basically those who right now are uh, working on specific uh, uh, activities. And uh, the, uh, I would like maybe to, uh, to start uh, with uh, you, Carter, if it's, uh, if it's okay. So as uh, Carter is a uh, CEO of uh, WWF uh, US, we, uh, we feel that we are very privileged to be working uh, with uh, Carter and his agency on Bhutan for Life, uh, a very ambitious project to uh, enable the government of Bhutan to keep 60% of its territory at least under forest cover. Uh, Bhutan right now is already uh, carbon neutral and intend to become carbon negative. So, Carter, can I, uh, can I give you the floor to uh, share the WWF experience in uh, supporting uh, developing countries' effort to... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Yannick, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for including me. I, I think everybody knows that forests are a huge source of carbon emissions. What may not be as well known is that forests play an essential role in either advancing or stopping the future spread of pandemics. We've just finished a scientific study of the nature of zoonotic disease risks, and we've identified that deforestation by bringing people and livestock deeper into wild areas increases the risk of disease jumping from bats to livestock and on to people in a way that is quite traumatic. And so not only does the GCF in collaborating with us and others to uh, halt deforestation address climate change, but it also addresses one of the root causes of future pandemics at the same time. We, uh, Yannick mentioned that um, we are collaborating already with a pilot in Bhutan, which is creating um, a mechanism to build a consortium of donors around uh, the opportunity for governments to secure their protected area system and create jobs at the same time. And uh, that, that, that collaboration was actually made famous uh, in a TED talk by the Prime Minister of Bhutan. Um, and I encourage everyone to watch it. It's, um, uh, it's, it's quite colorful. And uh, we are now working together with the GCF on similar projects in Peru and Colombia and, um, and considering more projects beyond. The, the essence of this work is all about uh, knitting together um, uh, finance from international finance um, institutions, private donors, and commercial finance um, to create a mechanism, a platform to not only secure protected areas, but also to restore the buffer zones around those areas and to create jobs at the same time. 
And in every conversation we have with governments, um, job creation is right next to um, uh, handling uh, the care part of uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, we believe that this goes a long way into creating jobs in all these areas. And right now, uh, the most active project that we have is working with the government of Colombia in a project called Herencia Colombia that brings together um, many finance institutions, many donors, and uh, commercial institutions and corporations to secure that company's glittering array of parks, but at the same time manage the transition in terms of rural jobs um, uh, for that country as part of their peace plan. And President Duque has just asked us, along with the Inter-American Development Bank, to create a new data platform that uses artificial intelligence, satellite imaging, and, um, and monitoring to visualize results against this plan, to report back uh, to investors on the return on their investment. And we believe um, by doing this now in the Colombian Amazon, will create a platform that could be used across the Amazon. And I think uh, many people know that President Duque brought together all the heads of state in the Amazon for the, the Leticia Pact. Those heads of state are now looking ahead to another aspect of the COVID-19 recovery, which is how do they launch large scale infrastructure in different countries across the Amazon to not only immediately create jobs, but also to create a greater pathway for economic recovery. I think we all know that done poorly, that type of infrastructure will not only create a high, could create a high carbon economy, it could also destroy the forests that um, contribute to uh, carbon emissions and contribute to pandemics if they're destroyed. And so there's an opportunity right now working in Colombia and working with other heads of state in that region to design infrastructure, to catalyze investment around green infrastructure and green pathways to development that keeps those forests intact, but also lays the foundation for a sustainable future. And that's yet another opportunity for the GCF to play a catalytic role. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carter. Uh, we are indeed not only at the turning point where we could uh, ensure that uh, the uh, economic stimulus uh, to uh, revive economies uh, after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic are uh, not only efficient from an economic viewpoint, but also green, but we could be also at a tipping point where uh, if uh, most of this uh, economic stimulus uh, were to go toward uh, financing highways and additional cars, and the construction in uh, virgin uh, natural uh, areas, we will basically cross the threshold, we will not recover. So we are, uh, one of our previous uh, panelists has, has mentioned that we were at a historical point and we are either at a turning point or a, a tipping point. The, uh, speaking about uh, the poorest of the poorest, uh, could I now give uh, you the floor as a floor, uh, Kazi? Kazi Ahmad is the chairman of PKSF, and uh, it's a non governmental organization who is working on the enhancing the resilience of some of the poorest communities in Bangladesh, notably communities in the flood prone uh, area. I served in Bangladesh and uh, the, I can be witness of uh, a remarkable the work uh, that uh, uh, organization such as yours is. The, uh, you have the same uh, problem than before about uh, the mic. I have to unmute. Is that all right? You can hear me. Okay. Thank you, Yannick. And thank you all of you. Thank all of you, panelists and uh, excellencies. Lord Ahmad is here. He has mentioned that there are two Ahmads in the panel. I may inform him that many years ago, I was at LSE and I lived in Wimbledon, 85 Graham Road, in fact. <laughs> so there is a connection here between Ahmads. Uh, let me start by saying that um, climate change has been worsening, we know. 
And I was uh, in IPCC, IPCC workers, they tell us that we have only a few years uh, before uh, we act or we perish. So that's worsening. And at the same time, now we get COVID, which is impacting on the human capability to corroding effects on health, on education, and on the economy. So we have a situation which is unprecedented, as has been mentioned, and therefore we need unprecedented action. Action, I have been part of uh, UNFCC negotiations for many years. In fact, I have seen the birth of GCF in Cancun and then worked through Durban, Qatar and Warsaw when it was housed in, in Korea. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few words towards the end about, about, about GCF. But before that, let me tell you, some of the countries, like Bangladesh, for example, uh, we have this COVID-19 situation like any other country, but we have had a cyclone this year. Then there's a coastal flood, and now there is a flood in various parts of the country. And I believe um, many other countries are suffering like that. So to, green, to go for green recovery requires a massive effort. We need green recovery, otherwise we'll be much more impacted by the climate change uh, disasters. But we also need economic and social recovery at the same time, so it's uh, sustainable development. So there we are. In Bangladesh, the government has prioritized, first of all, saving lives from COVID-19. Secondly, saving livelihoods of the people who have lost their jobs and have been affected by all of floods. And thirdly, recovery, which the, the environment minister the other day was talking about, they are thinking of green recovery. So I think this will be a green, I have an objection, green recovery. I have always objected to it. You can't have every country same amount of greening. You know, it varies from country to country depending on the circumstances. So you can address climate change, you can address environmental issues, but necessarily you may not get a green economy uh, in two years or three years or five years or 10 years. It may take longer for some countries, some countries may do it earlier. So that's one of the issues that was asked, green recovery. It is practical and it is not practical also. Uh, it depends on the time and the circumstances of the particular country, what we can do about uh, greening and at the same time promoting economy, uh, uh, lowering poverty rate and then life saving livelihoods. Now, about PKSF, you have mentioned Polycom, PKSF or Polycormo Shohayak Foundation is an organization, is a foundation. It's a PPP, public private partnership organization in that sense. Three members of the board nominated by the government, including the chairman myself, and three members are elected by the general body members. So it's a PPP and it's working very well, in fact. And we work through, the, through NGOs. They implement the programs. We design the programs, we provide the funding, we do the monitoring, and they implement the project. Our so, source of fund is government, mo mostly, but also we get international funding from the World Bank, IFAD, Asian Development Bank, I think uh, KW, KFW, uh, DFID, and uh, EU, uh, but these these monies come to the government and they then pass it on to us. We don't directly contract money from anybody. So it, in, in a sense, it's a it's a it's a government uh, providing funding to PKSF to do all these things. We follow a an integrated approach, centering on the human being, and that's sustainable development. That's the heart at the heart of that. Uh, it is. Uh, in sustainable development, it has to be equitable, it has to be participatory, uh, it has to be human freedom. So all of these, unless met, you can't get sustainable development. That's the, that's the narrative behind it. And therefore, uh, what PKSF has been working on it since 2010. And we have a project called Enrich, in which we have been trying to focus on human capability development and then addressing economic, social, and environmental issues together. Simultaneously, it's difficult, but we have been able to show that it can be done. 
So we have been doing that a lot. We also work with GCF. Uh, I have not mentioned GCF funding. I think we are one of uh, 14 direct access entities uh, in LDCs. And there is another one in Bangladesh. We have received the first funding in Bangladesh of a project of uh, $13 million worth. GCF provides $10 million. Uh, so that's a, that's a good start. We have several others pending. I hope they will come through. Now, funding has to be, this is one of the things we discussed when GCF was being created. $100 billion would be provided for climate funding. Not necessarily all will go to GCF, but a substantial part would have gone, was supposed to have gone to, to GCF. But GCF mobilized in the first 10 years or so only less than 10 million, can be a 10 billion, and another 10 billion probably being replenished, so it's less than 20. Today it should have been at least 50, 60 billion, but it's now only 20 if that comes through. The commitment sometimes comes, but it takes longer, it takes time. And in the meantime, people suffer, and the, pro and the situations become, become worse. So multilateral and bilateral also, I think, should come together and see how uh, funding can be catalyzed. And that's what Amina Muhammad has mentioned, the Deputy Secretary General, that GCF may catalyze public and private funding. I don't know how private funding can be catalyzed by GCF. I don't know, maybe you, you know how you can do it, but I have difficulty with private sectors. They are not going to fund anything where there is no profit to be made. And that's absolutely clear to me because I have worked in many countries also around the world, Africa in particular. So private sector does not uh, provide, well, some maybe, Bill Gates and so on, after they have made a lot of money, provide some philanthropic uh, assistance. But private sector, active private sector, they don't. So I don't know how you can mobilize that and how you can raise the, uh, raise the amount of money that you can provide to the, to the countries, no idea. For example, in NDC in Bangladesh. The, the, uh, the, the, okay, I just finished, uh, 42 and 28, 42 for adaptation and 28 billion for mitigation. We, we need it. And uh, we have not been able to receive a, just a fraction of it. So how, catalyzing is one thing, but then funding coming from the various sources, that's another. So commitment is one and delivery is another. So I think all these issues we have to now consider in the, in the particular situation now that we are in, where existential issue of the human society is before us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kazi. Your questions about how can GCF catalyze private sector uh, investment. We have actually another accredited entity of uh, GCF who is uh, maybe the best possible person to uh, address uh, this question. It's uh, Jacqueline, who is the CEO of uh, Acumen, our first uh, equity uh, investment fund. And Remy, I've received already three messages from my team telling me that you were online. So I've noticed <laughs> the, uh, but so the given the, the, I think it's, if you have if your authorization, I would prefer to give the floor to Jacqueline so that we have a, a direct communication between the Kazi and, and Jacqueline. So Jacqueline, that's the introductory question. How can the GCF catalyze private investment for sustainable development? for green resilient recovery, for maintaining and enhancing climate ambition in the era of COVID-19. Thanks, Yannick. And Kazi, really appreciated what you were saying. And it's certainly something that's been on our minds at Acumen. Um, and also, Yannick, I thought you brilliantly framed this conversation around the need for urgency, for partnership, um, and for blended finance. So in the few minutes that I have, I'm going to try to cover that. Um, just quickly, what Acumen does, we are essentially looking to invest the right kind of capital, importantly in the right kind of character, surrounded by the right community for change. Um, Kazi, to look at from our perspective, if I think of the three, th the three pieces that Yannick laid out, the first is partnership in terms of the spectrum of capital um, in that we need all different kinds of capital. And I think you touch on that. 
And so it starts with grants, but you know, when you hear Minister Aforiata speak about how much resource we actually have on the continent and in of Africa and in so many countries around the world, how do we actually build pipeline? And that's where we need patient capital, grant backed investing capital so that we can actually help support local con entrepreneurs and build the companies that more traditional financing can crowd into. And so we've put about 140 million of that kind of patient capital so that then we could partner and crowd in another 850 million um, to support companies that have in turn reached 300 million uh, low income people. Two, partnership between organizations like GCF and um, financial intermediaries like Acumen, World Wildlife Foundation and others. Um, we are working with GCF in two areas that might be of use because they are all around government, private sector, NGO, and how do we move capital more effectively. Um, the first is an off-grid energy where GCF um, was the first investor um, of a $70 million off-grid solar electricity fund. That allowed us then to have a direct impact, a direct investing of 3.5x into the fund, which has now been deployed over the last couple of years um, and has allowed us then to crowd in another 30x into the companies that Kawisafi, which means clean energy in Swahili, um, has supported. Uh, Rwanda is one of the NDAs. It's really focused on Rwanda and in Kenya. And that fund has brought electricity to 25 million people. But I think we really short change it if you just focus on the entity alone. That then leverages other kinds of partnerships across an energy ecosystem, which I'm gonna come back to um, for my third point on urgency. Um, the second really goes to blended capital and how do we see partnership between entities like GCF and, um, and other players to bring in the, the spectrum of different kinds of players that want to create change. And so this, this is for an agriculture, a resiliency and agriculture facility um, where GCF actually put up 50% of first loss capital and um, for 50%, excuse me, 50% of first loss capital um, to crowd in um, funding from philanthropists to um, more traditional uh, investment organizations to, um, to DFIs like Soros, like FMO. And, um, and there, not only do you have a 50% first loss, which is some, something so powerful that GCF can do, but there's a recognition that side by side, you need significant grant capital so that you can, particularly with smallholder farmers, in an era, and Ken, uh, Minister Foriato referred to this as well, in an era where you're seeing reduced commodity prices, where you're seeing um, all of the impact of climate, where you're seeing disrupted supply chains, where that grant facility can also then work with the companies who are working with smallholder farmers to enable them better to address the situation, build their talent, um, create better markets and do marketing. And so that kind of blended Facility is not just about crowding in private capital, but using that capital for real change. And then the third is really where I see also um, community, the, the power of urgency. And this is where all of us need to change. Um, over 15 years of investing in off-grid energy has now led to many other players coming in and a sector that accounts for about 460 million low-income people who now have solar light and electricity. And that also accounts for 350,000 jobs. So when we recognize that you've still got a fragile sector that is so critical, not only to energy poverty, the economy, and helping to avert long-term climate crisis, we, we came together first with CDC and then with a series of other um, financing organizations, again, across the gamut, from aid organizations to traditional investment banks. Um, we are in, we're discussing with GCF as well, being part of what we hope will be a $100 million 
emergency concessionary debt facility so that we can move and, and save jobs, enable these companies to position themselves for a post-COVID world. Um, it is really stark when you're on that ground right now because 25% of the, the 500 companies or 491 companies that have applied for this facility um, have already stopped operating in the last three months. Another 75% um, have only three months of cash on their books. And so all of our traditional um, bureaucracies that have so often um, just waited, created, needed time, have got to think about how do we actually have emergency, urgent policy shifts within institutions so that we can move this kind of capital. And so again, it's about partnership, it's about trust, where, where financing organizations and governments who know each other and trust each other, this is our moment to move more quickly. And it has been exciting to me to see some of our institutions um, really look to try and get incredibly creative. And I know that GCF and Yannick's uh, leadership is one of those that are thinking about how do we do this? Because we will not do it in an isolated way. Um, we will only do it together. And um, I see Minister Foriata back on the call and uh, in, with the agriculture facility, we're actually uh, doing that in partnership with Ghana. So um, excited to see that we are working with two of the countries represented on this call and, um, and also feel deep urgency that we need to use our moral imagination, not only to rethink our overall global architecture, but then to build role models, examples of how we can move together to create change in a way that protects the most vulnerable. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. I still remember uh, when I read uh, your email uh, very early one morning telling me, wake up, wake up, uh, with COVID-19, uh, most of uh, this uh, so small and medium enterprises uh, that uh, we have been financing to uh, foster off-grid uh, uh, renewable energy development are to face a liquidity problem that will become a solvency problem if we, uh, if we do not do something very quickly. Uh, as you know, it's... Uh, I couldn't agree more with you about uh, I know the need to be able to provide this kind of emergency fund. I and would really like also to see Minister um, Mujama yeah. Maria coming back on the call as well, because yeah. Ghana and Rwanda are, you feel that same urgency and that is what we need right now. Uh, Minister of Ariata, you were cut. You, we lost uh, the communication. Is there some final remarks uh, that uh, you would like to make? Because suddenly we, we lost connection. Thank you very much, Yannick, and thank you, Jacqueline. Um, this is great. So I think really Jacqueline captures it. it it's just the urgency uh, of the moment and sometimes the sense um, uh, that the world is beginning to normalize um, this pandemic, which is um, really um, something we haven't seen before. So you are beginning to feel almost a, like a spiritual stupor um, to find ways to continue as is. And we are really caught in this web and therefore leaderships like yours and others will be required to, 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 to take us out of this um, comfort zone and really realize that um, this is an opportunity um, to make some dramatic tectonic changes uh, in the framework because there's enough resources in different silos um, that can really um, create a much more prosperous and equal world. Um, so thank you for your platform. So, thank you very much, Ken. The uh, uh, Remy, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, introduce you. The Remy is, uh, has uh, several ads, but two very important, is a chair uh, person of uh, the International Development Finance Club, the uh, basically an association that bring together uh, 24, I believe, of the largest uh, national development banks uh, in the world. Only the IDFC, uh, it's about it's over $300 billion of uh, investment in climate nowadays. And uh, uh, Rémy is also the CEO of the Agence Française uh, de Développement. The Agence Française de Développement is uh, as basically committed uh, to a 100% alignment with the uh, Paris Agreement. So uh, the uh, 
uh, Remy, you're organizing uh, the uh, first World Summit of National Development Bank uh, in November. The, how do you believe that your constituency can help developing country uh, finance a green resilient recovery? Um, thanks a lot, Yannick. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, ministers, uh, excellencies, colleagues. Um, very interesting to speak last, uh, hearing uh, uh, the concerns, the urgency uh, expressed by all um, all panelists, and see how we we can help. So you're right. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of uh, AFD, IGFC. Uh, I would say more broadly speaking, um, uh, with the heart of a, of a public uh, development bank, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is a moment, of course, uh, as in each and every crisis, but especially because of the depth uh, uh, of this COVID uh, event uh, and worldwide dimension, where these very unique institutions uh, have a special uh, role and. Uh, responsibility uh, on behalf of the, the government. Um, we know within public development banks that uh, long term has become short term uh, and, and in reverse, I would say, uh, that we have to, um, to be counter cyclical uh, and so the, the urgency and all of us, we are expanding our balance sheet quite, quite significantly. Uh, right now, like uh, like in 2008 and 9, uh, that's what I keep from uh, uh, my members. Um, and we have to keep the long-term uh, perspective, that of uh, the day after the day after. <laughs> uh, not only tomorrow, but also what's the long-term target uh, for this uh, recovery. Uh, we are also it was expressed by many of you, by, by Ahmad, by uh, Gozi, by uh, Jacqueline, of course. We are institutions that are between public and private. We are owned by the government, of course. But we are uh, issuing bonds, uh, we are providing guarantees. Uh, we are more and more trying to crowd in uh, uh, private uh, investors as far as we can. And so um, this bridging uh, capacity has to be uh, to be mobilized we are very local uh, as you're saying uh, a lot of uh, national or sub-national public banks uh, but more and more connected and that's what we are doing today to the global uh, conversation and the global and um, aligned implementing uh, global priorities we are also a place uh, i feel it at ifds very strongly where we uh, we come from the climate, and now we are turning to SDGs, uh, ex exploring, trying to understand, trying to finance what uh, just transition is about, and the nexus uh, between the one health was mentioned. I mean, the nexus between the several uh, several SDGs. The stigma, probably stigma attached to public banks, yet <laughs> that I think we have urgently uh, to remove. Of course, if we demonstrate that we are uh, well governed, uh, which is very often the case, and that we turn into platforms, uh, Jacqueline, and so that we are bridging, helping, financing as many stakeholders as possible, uh, turning uh, to sustainable uh, development. And, and this is where, of course, uh, we turn to the GCF, Yannick. Uh, uh, and because um, the GCF is, um, uh, incentivizing us, the GCF is recognizing us, and this is uh, what the strategic partnership we signed between IDFC and you. Uh, this is why it is so so important, and we feel we can help the, the GCF like other stakeholders to channel uh, GCF funding in the right uh, direction. We have uh, within IDFC uh, already uh, 12 uh, members accredited, about uh, 800 million dollars. Uh, mobilized uh, from the fund uh, to originate uh, quality uh, climate projects, but also more and more to, to do the capacity building of our members. And you help us, uh, Yannick, spur uh, cooperation uh, among uh, 
among public development banks, and, and that's extremely helpful. At AFD, uh, just to give a few examples, we are working, uh, it was mentioned in the conversation on fluid management. Uh, in Senegal, we are working on irrigation in uh, Morocco, water management in Palestine, very nice project, and also on uh, reorienting um, the financial sector with the uh, transforming finance system for, for climate, TFSC uh, program, which is a very large one, doing, uh, doing very well. And working on mobility in Latin America with CAF, with uh, GIZ, uh, with others working on energy efficiency, hopefully with uh, many, many uh, uh, partners. And uh, we are planning to, uh, we, we are hosting a climate facility for IDFC at AFD. And I know you're paying attention to it, uh, Yannick. Uh, be the glue somehow between all these institutions uh, to go in the right direction. And I, I close by saying um, that, uh, well, this is where we stand, but we want to do way more. Uh, and we want to, we are at a turning point. Uh, and we want to um, now mobilize, structure, uh, incentivize the whole community of public development banks. Because uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there are 450 public development banks in the world. Um, uh, there's one uh, in Rwanda, uh, Minister uh, Jeanne d'Arc, there's one in Ghana. There's, there's, uh, they amount for $2.5 trillion investments a year, which means 10% of global investments, public and private, they are public uh, and they could be shared and uh, uh, more helpful probably than, than they are. And so we will, um, November the 12th, uh, gather the whole community uh, in Paris um, to see if, uh, enlightened by research, a research program, uh, to take uh, position, uh, have a joint declaration, have specific commitments, for invent uh, very operational deliverables with your help, and uh, do as much as we can on, on, on uh, climate. So we offer the GCF uh, and all of you uh, an opportunity to leverage uh, this community and turn it uh, in the right direction. So we need your help. We were already recognized by COP26. Uh, um, Lord Ahmed, uh, and I think we, we will have the label of COP26 and we want somehow to open the way uh, to Glasgow on the finance track, mobilizing uh, uh, public banks uh, on, at the benefit of uh, all uh, financing uh, institutions. COP15 is there as well, uh, helping us. You, uh, Yannick, with the, with the GCF, you were a member of our executive committee uh, building, the, building the summit, but we also need governments. Uh, we need international organizations. We need all the participants uh, to this webinar to uh, pay attention, to challenge the group, uh, to help us move in the a, in a, in a right uh, direction. So we don't know how far, but believe me, uh, we will try. Thanks a lot. Many, many, many thanks, uh, uh, Remy. The, uh, the, uh, I think it's, it was a wonderful uh, discussion. If, uh, if I'm ever asked to, uh, to try to, uh, to convince uh, a candidate to join uh, the Green Climate Fund, I will maybe ask uh, this candidate to watch uh, the video of this event because uh, one of the greatest threats threat about working uh, with the GCF is a wide range of partners from some of the largest commercial bank in the world, some of the la largest national, uh, uh, the national, regional, uh, multilateral development bank, some of the most creative NGOs working at the community level, equity fund pushing uh, the, uh, the wisdom of uh, what an equity fund should be about. I think it's a, it's a rare privilege to be able to, uh, to, to, to work with such a, such a rich range of partners. It's a rare privilege village or so to be able to count on the support of uh, such a large number of uh, governments. So I feel extremely honored to have, uh, to have been part of uh, one of uh, yours uh, uh, tonight uh, for those uh, on, uh, in, uh, in Korea or uh, this afternoon or this morning, for this, this afternoon for uh, Europe or uh, uh, this morning for uh, United States. The, uh, I will not attempt to, uh, to summarize uh, this extremely rich discussion in the remaining minutes, but so there are at least a couple of key uh, messages 
that uh, we can take away. The first thing is that so if we want to uh, to uh, to avoid ID, uh, uh, adding uh, unfairness to inequity, and if we want to make sure that we can foster a green resilient recovery based on global solidarity, we have to uh, align uh, finance, global finance, with sustainable development. And uh, a number of different options have been uh, mentioned by our uh, esteemed panelists. One is basically blended finance to de-risk investment and move the money from negative interest rate to highly uh, desirable uh, projects. Uh, I had mentioned $17 trillion earning negative rate. Uh, rate. Uh, Minister of Ariata actually corrected me and mentioned that we were speaking about much more than uh, uh, $17 trillion. And why not to start thinking about how can we uh, basically uh, influence the entire $100 trillion uh, under uh, asset uh, management. Uh, other key points that David mentioned is that so maybe we would need enough public money to catalyze this private money. And the first step could be to make sure that the $100 billion that have been mentioned uh, as part of the Paris agreements uh, are uh, honored. The, uh, we, uh, we had several uh, uh, suggestions made on the, the role of SDRs. The, uh, a very good summary by uh, Remy about the unbelievable importance of the 450 uh, national development banks. One of the most powerful statistics that I've read recently came from uh, yeah, your group, Remy, when uh, you did compile the total investment of all the national development bank and came to the conclusion that we were speaking about $2 trillion, 10% of total global investment. If we could truly leverage that for good, for, as a force for good, as a force to foster green, resilient uh, uh, recovery. The uh, a number of uh, institutional innovations have been mentioned, such as uh, Green Investment Bank, to be able to be part of uh, this process. The role of uh, civil society organization to make sure that we are speaking about a legitimate and uh, process. The, uh, so we have here a number of pointers on how to catalyze finance for green resilient recovery based on global solidarity in developing countries. There was also a number, another part of the discussion that was, uh, can we afford green? And uh, the, uh, there was a very strong consensus uh, that uh, it's not can we afford green, but can we afford not to be green? And that's really, we cannot afford not to be green uh, today. And uh, green is not at the expense of social. There is no green without social. The two have to be together. And uh, with, uh, with a very strong consensus among the speakers about the relevance of the concept of sustainable development, green, social, and uh, economic. So on behalf of uh, all the participants in this event, I would like to deeply thank all of you and ask uh, for uh, a second round of uh, virtual applause for our panelists. Many thanks to all of you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Can I go, Marshall? <laughs>